Well, welcome back. Well, did you guess what they all saw that made them dismay? Let's find out. Chapter 8 What News the Eagle Brought In the shadow of the trees on the far side of the clearing, something was moving. It was gliding very slowly northward. At a first glance, you might have mistaken it for smoke, for it was gray and you could have seen things and you could see things through it. But the deadly smell was not the smell of smoke. Also, this thing kept its shape instead of billowing and curling as smoke would have done. It was roughly the shape of a man, but it had the head of a bird, some bird of prey with a cruel curved beak. It had four arms, which it held high above its head, stretched out, stretching them out northward as if it wanted to snatch all Narnia into its grip, and its fingers, all twenty of them were curved like its beak and had long pointed bird-like claws instead of nails. It floated down on the grass instead of walking, and the grass seemed to wither beneath it. After one look at it, Puzzle gave a screaming bray and darted into the tower. And Jill, who was no coward as you know, hid her face in her hands to shut out the sight of it. The others watched it for perhaps a minute until it streamed away into the thicker trees on the right and disappeared. Then the sun came out again and the birds once more began to sing. Everyone started breathing properly again and moved. They all had been still as statues while it was in sight. What was that? said Eustace in a whisper. I've seen it once before, said Tyrion, but that time it was carved in stone and overlaid with gold and had solid diamonds for eyes was when I was no, no older than thou, and I had gone to, as a guest to the Tisrock's court in Tashban. He took me to the great temple of Tash. There I saw it carved upon the altar. Then that, that thing was Tash, said Eustace. But instead of answering him, Tyrion slipped his arm behind Jill's shoulder and said, How is it with you, lady? Uh, all right said Jill, taking her hands away from her pale face and trying to smile. I I'm all right. It's, it only made me feel a little sick for a moment. It seems then, said the unicorn, that there is a real Tash, after all. Yes, said the dwarf, and this fool of an ape, who didn't believe in Tash, will get more than he bargained for. He called for Tash. Tash has come. Where has it, he, the thing, gone to, said Jill. North, into the heart of Narnia, said Tyrion. It has come to dwell among us. They have called it, and it has come. Ho, 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 chuckled the dwarf, rubbing his, his hairy hands together. It will be a surprise for the ape. People shouldn't call for demons unless they really mean what they say. Who knows if Tash will be visible to the ape? said Jewel. Where's Puzzle got to? said Eustace. They all shouted out Puzzle's name and Jill went round to the other side of the tower to see where he had gone, if he had gone there. They were quite tired of looking for him when at last his large gray head peered cautiously out of the doorway and he said, Has it gone away? And when they said at last they, uh, and when at last they got him to come out, he was shivering the way a dog shivers after a thunderstorm. I see now, said Puzzle, that I really have been a very bad donkey. I ought never to have listened to Shift. I never thought things like this would begin to happen. If you'd spent less time saying you weren't clever and more time trying to be as clever as you could, began Eustace, but Jill interrupted him. Oh, leave poor Puzzle alone, she said. It was all a mistake, wasn't it, dear Puzzle? And she kissed him on the nose. The red, they're shaken by what they had seen. The whole party now sat down again and went on with their talk. 
Jewel had little to tell them. While he was a prisoner, he had spent nearly all his time tied up at the back of the stable and, of course, heard none of the enemy's plans. He had been kicked. He'd done some of the kicking back, too, and beaten and threatened with death, death unless he said he be- would say that he believed it was Aslan who was brought out and shown to them by firelight every night. In fact, he was going to be executed that morning if he had not been rescued. He didn't know at all what happened to the lamb. The question they had to decide was whether they would go to a stable hill again that night, show puzzle to the Narnians, and try and make them see how they had been tricked, or whether they should steal away eastward to meet the the help which Runewit the centaur was bringing up from Ker Paravel and return against the apinist Kalermans in force. Tyrion would very much like to have followed the first plan. He hated the idea of leaving the ape to bully his people one moment longer than need be. On the other hand, the way the dwarves had behaved the previous night was a warning. Apparently no one could be sure how people would take it, even if they showed them puzzle. And there were the Kalaman soldiers to be reckoned with. Pogan thought there were about thirty or so of them. Tyrion felt sure that if the Narnians all rallied to his side, he and Jewel and the children and Pogan, and puzzle didn't count for much, would have a good chance of beating them. But how if half the Narnians, including all the dwarves, just sat and looked on, or even fought against him? The risk was too great. And there was, too, the cloudy shape of Tash. What might it do? And then, as Pogan pointed out, there was no harm in leaving the ape to deal with his own difficulties for a day or two. He would have no puzzle to bring out and show now. It wasn't easy to see what story he, or Ginger, could make up to explain that. If the beasts asked, night after night to see Aslan, and no Aslan was brought out, surely even the simplest of them would get suspicious. In the end, they all agreed that the best thing to do was to go off and to try and meet Runewit. As soon as they had decided this, it was wonderful how much more cheerful everyone became. I don't honestly think that this was because any of them was afraid of a fight, except perhaps Jill and Eustace, but I dare say that each of them, deep deep down inside, was very glad not to go any nearer or not yet, to that horrible bird-headed thing which, visible or invisible, was now probably haunting Stable Hill. Anyway, one always feels better when one has made up one's mind. Tyrion said that they had better remove their disguises, so they didn't want to be mistaken for Calamans and perhaps attacked by any loyal Narnians they might meet. The dwarf made up a horrible-looking mess of ashes from the hearth, and grease out of the jar of grease, which kept, uh, was kept for rubbing on, on swords and spearheads. Then they took off their calaman armor and went down to the stream. The nasty mi- mixture made a lather just like soft soap. It was a pleasant, homely sight to see Tyrion and the two children kneeling beside the water and scrubbing the backs of their necks and puffing and blowing as they splattered the lather off. Then they went back to the tower with red, shiny faces, looking like people who have had an extra, been given an extra special good wash before a party. They rearmed themselves in true Narnian style with straight swords and three-cornered shields. Body of me, said Tyrion, that is better. I feel a true man again. Puzzle begged very hard to have the lion skin taken off him. He said it was too hot and the way it was rucked up on his back was uncomfortable. Also, it made him look so silly, but they told him they would have to wear it a bit longer. But they still wanted to show him in it, in that get-up to other beasts, even though they were now going to have to, uh, going to meet Runewit first. With what was left of the pigeon meat and the rabbit meat, it was not worth bringing away, uh, but they took some biscuits. Then Tyrion locked the door of the tower, and that was the end of their stay there. It was a little after two in the afternoon when they set out, and it was the first really warm day of that spring. The young leaves seemed to be much further out than yesterday. The snowdrops were over, but there were several primroses. The sunlight slanted through the trees. Birds sang, and as always, as though usually at night, there was a noise of running water. It was hard to think of horrible things like tash. The children felt... This is really Narnia at last. Even Tyrion's heart grew lighter as he walked ahead of them, humming an old Narnian march song, which had the refrain, Ho, rumble, 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 drum, belabored. 
After the king came, after the king came Eustace and Pogan the dwarf. Pogan was telling Eustace the names of the Narnian trees, birds, and plants, which he didn't know already. Sometimes Eustace would tell him about English ones. After them came Puzzle, and after him Jill and Jewel, walking very close together. Jill had, as you might say, quite fallen in love with the unicorn. She thought, and she wasn't far wrong, that he was the shiniest, delicatest, most graceful animal she had ever met. And he was so gentle and soft of speech that if you hadn't, uh, if you hadn't known, you would hardly have believed how fierce and terrible he could be in battle. Oh, this is nice, said Jill, just walking along like this. I wish there could be more of this sort of adventure. It's a pity there's always so much happening in Narnia. But the unicorn explained to her that she was quite mistaken. He said that the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve were brought out of their own strange world into Narnia only at times when Narnia was stirred and upset. But she mustn't think that it was always like that. In between their visits, there were hundreds and thousands of years when peaceful king followed peaceful king till you could hardly remember their names or count their numbers. And there was really hardly anything to put into the history books. And he went on to talk of old queens and heroes whom he had, she had never heard of. He spoke of Swan, right, Swan White the Queen, who had lived before the days of the White Witch and the Great Winter, who was so beautiful that when she looked into any forest pool, the reflection of her face shone out of the water like a star by night for a year and a day afterwards. He spoke of Moonwood the Hare, who had such ears that he could sit by cauldron pool under the thunder of the great waterfall and hear what men spoke in whispers at Care Paravel. He told of King Gael, who was ninth in descent from Frank, the first of all kings, had sailed far away into the eastern seas and delivered the Lone Islanders from a dragon, and how, in a turn, they had given him the Lone Islands to be part of the royal lands of Narnia forever. He talked of more of whole centuries in which all Narnia was so happy that notable dances and feasts, or at most tournaments, were the only things that could be remembered, and every day and week had been better than the last. And as he went on, the picture of all those happy years, all the thousands of them, piled up in Jill's mind till it was rather like looking down from a high hill onto a rich, lovely plain full of woods and water, waters and cornfields, which spread away and away till it got thin and misty from distance. And she said, Oh, I do hope we can soon settle the ape and get back to those good ordinary times. And then I hope They'll go on forever and ever and ever. Our world is going to have an end someday. Perhaps this one won't. Oh, Jewel, wouldn't it be lovely if Narnia just went on and on like what you said it has been? Nay, sister, answered Jewel, all worlds draw to an end except Aslan's own country. Well, at least I hope this one, uh, the end of this one is millions and millions and millions of years away. Hello. What are we stopping for? The king and Eustace and the dwarf were all staring up at the sky. Jill shuddered, remembering what horrors they had seen already. But it was nothing of that sort this time. It was small and looked black against the blue. I dare swear, said the unicorn from its flight, that it's a talking bird. So think I, said the king, but is it friend or a spy of the apes? To me, sire, said the dwarf, it looks... It has a look of farsight, the eagle. Ought we to hide under the trees, said Eustace? Nay, said Terry, and best stand still as rocks. He would see us for certain if we moved. Look, he wheels. He has seen us already, said Jewel. He's coming down in wide circles. Arrow on string, lady, said Terry to Jill, but by no means shoot till I bed you. He may be a friend. If one had known what was going to happen next, it would have been a treat to watch the grace and ease with which the huge bird glided down. He alighted on a rocky crag a few feet from Tyrion, bowed his crested head, and said in his strange eagle voice, Hail, king! Hail, Farsight, said Tyrion, and since you call me king, I may well believe you are not a follower of the ape and his false Aslan. Am I right glad of your coming? Or I am right glad of your coming. Sire, said the eagle, 
When you have heard my news, you will be sorrier of my coming than of the greatest foe that ever befell you. Tyrion's heart, team, heart seemed to stop beating at these words, but he set his teeth and said, Tell on. Two sights have I seen, said Farsight. One was Ker Paravel, filled with dead Narnians and living Calermans. The Tisrox banner advanced upon your royal battlements and your subjects flying from the city, this way and that into the woods. Ker Paravel was taken from the sea. Twenty great ships of Calamon put in the dark of the night before last. No one could speak. On the other side, five leagues nearer to, than Ker Paravel was Rune with the centaur, lying dead with a Calamon arrow in his side. I was with him in his last hour, and he gave me this message to your majesty, to remember that all worlds draw to an end, and that noble death is a treasure which no one is too poor to buy. So, said the king after a long silence, Narnia is no more. That's the end of the chapter. But it's not over yet. I told you this was a tough book. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.